a clap or break. <laughs> She's button it no. We are rolling today is today is the sixteenth of December two thousand and fourteen. And it's our third interview meeting with David Tepperson. Migdal. Migdal. At your house in Kfal Shmariao and Chavatzelet Teisha or Eser? Eser. Eser. Okay. Uh, I want to read. I want to read something that I read, and this is somebody describing you. There was a real. <clears throat> there was a lot of types of. Uh, there was a, a lot of interesting types of South African volunteers. One of them, David Tapperson, six foot six, called Migdal in Hebrew for the word tower, wore a pair of army boots with no socks, a pair of khaki shorts, and a heavy belt with a big commando knife hanging from it. A bullet belt with two soldier straps on which hung from, which hung two mills, two mill grenades, an Australian slouch, slouch hat, and a sten gun which with he said he didn't feel distressed. The stem gun? It was a very weak weapon. <laughs> I carried a couple of other guns together. Did you? Yeah. What was your I uh, never had one gun. You never had one gun. I'm big, so tell I could, me, tell me, tell I'd me, take the brain I'm, I'd take a brain gun and I could carry it like other people carry a, 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 a stem gun. I'm a big boy, so the gun what didn't disturb me. So you had a thing of bullets around you? I had them too, on my, on my waist especially. And I had grenades, always had grenades. And, uh, well, I took part in a lot of actions. Of course, but you didn't wear any socks. How come you didn't wear any socks? Look, I grew up barefoot. Yeah. And in Africa, when we went to a thorn area, we'd slip our, our felt schooner, which were field, field shoes very rough leather that you slip into your shoes and uh, from barefoot to, to these shoes to where we had thorns and in the, in the afternoon you know we had thick meat from walking barefoot you had thick meat at the bottom so as school kids and even afterwards in the army my friends when the thorn went into your meat you had a very thick hide now, if you had a thick hide, the thorn didn't go through, but it t took maybe a week or two to work its way up, and then you'd feel it. When I'd feel it, my friend would take a razor blade, cut it, and squeeze them out. With the pus, also there would probably be, was it infected ever? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. No, a little bit of it, yeah. they didn't have to be. So it was, it was more comfortable for you to be with boots and no socks? That's right. And uh, you had a big beard? And a big beard. And you loved this, you loved roaming around the desert in jeeps, commando, I dirty. grew up. I grew up like that. I understand. To me, it wasn't. Uh, I went hunting in Namibia. When I was a young boy of eight, nine. I'd go with the uncles, and I'd end up carrying a couple of bucks. So I was a carrier. You shoot something, and they give me half a buck afterwards. Okay. Um, just to remind you, we are. Um, in our in our interviews, we are we are in the Negev right now. It is before um, the big operation. And which one? Um, I was in a couple. No, the big the one uh, not Hiram, That's up north. Um, the where we where we captured the South Negev. Yeah, that's a Mivza. Lot Hiram. I'll tell you in a moment. Okay. It ran away from my head. It's here also. Wait a second. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. You can give me some of that too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It says here, um, at times I grew a beard, da 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 da. Uh, I had a pair of World War II knee-high American clip-on. Okay. 
This is just a little bit more of your expression. Now, I'm going to read another little part that you wrote here in your book. At, at the time, we received a nice young Israeli lieutenant of 18 or 19 years old who became our platoon commander. His name was Mota Gur. Many years later, he became chief of staff. After moving back, back into the Negev, we received a new battalion commander called Chaim Barlev, who also became chief of the Israeli Joint Staff. So Motagur is your corporal. lieutenant. He's like your commander. He was my corporal. Excuse me? He was my corporal. He was your corporal. Very my lieutenant. Okay. He, he moved up. He moved up. Tell me about your first encounter with him, if you can, if you can recall. He was one of the boys. That did, uh, I understand that he was one of the boys, but I need you, I need, because Motagur is a very famous character in Israeli history, in Israeli military history. Yeah. I was at his wedding. Uh, he was one of the boys from the Palmach. Uh -huh. The old, that is a Palmach. Was, he was a good soul. Was he? Yeah. Yeah. We liked him. He liked the Anglo-Saxons. He, he had quite a lot of Anglo-Saxons. So he was in Chayot Amidbal? Chayot Amidbal. You guys were kind of the same age, no? Or he, like, you were maybe a little bit older than him. I'm a little bit older. Yeah. What kind of commander was he? No such thing. What I, he was one of the chevra. No, you automatically followed his acharai. You went acharai. I understand, but as a person, what kind of person was he? One of the boys. What can I tell you? Okay. Nothing more you can tell me about Mutagor. He was one of us. A story of you guys, something in the desert, any any anecdote, something. I'm not talking about, uh, about, uh, uh, um, um, uh, We had one story, we were sleeping at night. Okay. And, uh, Hananya was one of the, one of the jeep drivers. And, uh, we were sitting and sleeping in our jeeps. And, uh, Pepo was one of our corporals with the Bulgarians, and we were sitting and sleeping. And two Sudanim thought we were Egyptians. They came into our camp. Two what? Egyptian soldiers. Two Egyptian soldiers walked into your camp? Walked into our camp where they thought we were Egyptians. And they went to, and <laughs> I'll never forget the shouting. Uh, what, what was this? Uh, not what, he shouted, uh, Pepo, Pepo, Pepo was one of our corporals. And we were sitting sleeping and these Sudanese walked in. <laughs> I took my knife out, but I, I, I know I used my knife, but I don't want to remember, I didn't want to remember it. Why? And then I switched off which one, I stuck it. I know I killed one like that, and I shot two others. They walked into our camp. And uh, I remember the shouting, Peppo, Peppo! Peppo was one of our corporals. We were all sleeping in our jeeps. And here you had these Arabs walked into us, thinking we were Arabs. Uh, and these are the things that catch you, you know what I mean? Stay with you. And the, just the flashbacks, if you know what I mean. Sure. Uh, I had a couple of those. I was never scared, I always I wanted action. When you go into action, you don't think of you're going to get hurt. You think you're going to come out victory. You never think of the bad side. <clears throat> well, you've been there, so you know what I mean. Did you? Uh, what did you guys do to these two Sudanese soldiers? You you killed them. Hmm. These two Sud Sud Sudanese soldiers. Of course. You killed them. Yes. Was there? Was this is the first time I used a knife, and I don't want to remember it. Not a nice feeling, but I used it. To, I know I used it, and I don't want to go. You know what I mean? And uh, it's not a nice uh, feeling. 
First day I was very big and strong and I picked them up. I think I broke one snake. I'm not certain. But uh, you don't think that way. Why didn't you uh, take them prisoner? Why did you have to kill them? You're in the middle of the night. You're attacked. They didn't surrender. They didn't, okay. You don't surrender, it's you or him. Of course. But if they would have surrendered, we, we, we did take prisoners. Of course, yeah, that I know. From the that other I group. Know. And I know that story, we'll get to that in a, in a little bit later today about the... the a couple of times the, I took prisoners. P, yeah, the POWs that didn't want to go under That's your... That's right, they lay on the floor. They were scared of you. They lay on the floor. And I always say to people, Look, look at me and tell me why you didn't want to go with me. So I want was, you to was Motagur at this incident with the two Sudanese soldiers? Was he there with you? What? Motagur, was he there when these two Sudanese soldiers walked into your camp? Was he with you guys? Yes, he was with us. Yeah. I mean, he was one of the boys there. I don't remember everyone that was there, but he, he was there. But did he leave an impression on you at the time also? Uh, no, he was no, what, what, what one of the Hebra. I understand one of the Hever, but I'm trying to go beyond the Hever. I'm trying to understand... Barlev was with me too. Barlev, okay, we're going to get to Chaim Barlev in a second. So Motagur, there's not a lot you can tell me about him. Just that he was in the Hever, and that's it. I Nothing went else. to his wedding. Were you, uh, were you close with, to him throughout his life? Like, oh, uh, I, oh, all throughout his life I used to phone him, see him. We'd meet. You know, we'd get together the Palmach. It was like uh, they had a meeting of the Palmachnikim. Let's uh, just for the record, uh, Motagur was the chief of staff of the IDF. Yeah. During, was it during uh, the um, during Don't ask me during the seventies? I think. I don't. Somewhere. Yeah, there. in the seventies, and then Motagur. Just, I mean, I'm just. This is just for the record. Motagur went into politics. Yeah. Into the Labour Party. Yeah. Um. And he had a very tragic death. I think he had cancer. Mm -hmm. He had a very tragic death. He had cancer, and then I think right. he took he took his own life. Um, but he's a very. I liked him. He was one of the boys. Yeah. I've shown you the picture of him. Yes, it's in the book, and we're gonna look, we're gonna film it, those pictures at the end. We're gonna film all those pictures. Um, I've got also pictures with Barlev. With Barlev. Now, Barlev was also in Chayot Amidbar, but he was above uh, Motagor. Motagor. Can you tell me what his position was? Battalion commander. Battalion commander. Uh, company commander first, then battalion commander. First he was company commander, then battalion commander. Um, so he was like a, a captain. The mm -hmm. rank, like he was a ranking officer. That's right. Even though the so, Palmach people didn't wear, you guys didn't wear your ranks. No, no. So it was Montagur. Yeah. So Montagur was your like lieutenant, and Chaim Barlev was the platoon. Com uh, company commander. And, and uh, captain. What can you tell me about um, about Chaim Barlev? Because also he's a very famous, famous. Well, person. Chaim Barlev, uh, he was he, he was a very cool, quiet. Not excitable, you know, the quiet, follow me and you'd follow him. Automatic, he had leadership in him. So did Motta, but Chaim, you know, Motta was more, Chaim was very quiet. Yeah, reserved. Reserved man. Yeah. But uh, we respected him. And uh, I don't know how to put it, but it was like com comradeship. We did, they didn't speak Hebrew too much, English too much, and we didn't speak Hebrew. Right. Right. So there was a kind of uh, get to, somehow we got along. Because because of the fact that you guys didn't speak good English, good Hebrew, and they didn't speak good English, did 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 that play to your benefit a little bit of them being? You know what, you guys do your thing. We went along. Of course, you went along. I know. But there was a communication issue. Acharai, we all knew. It was Acharai. He went over the top, you went over the top. 
you did what he did. How many people did Chaim Barlev in Chayot Negev? how many people did he approximately have under his command? Approximately. I can't tell you. 20, 30? No, no, we were, we were a group of Chayot Negev, what we called. Yeah. There were, I think we were 30, 40 of us. It depends on when you come, because we kept, we kept increasing and, and dropping. Yeah. Were people leaving and coming and joining us. So we never had a fixed, from 20 to 40, put it that way. Because it varied, depending when. But Chaim Barlev, he was the commander. He was the authority down there with you guys. He, he yeah, was quite, his final word. Quiet, peaceful. Uh, can you, he had a good looking blonde wife. Yeah, he had a, he had a good looking blonde wife. Gotcha. Girlfriend. Girlfriend. Then, then she became his wife afterwards. And um, I had my I, I liked her. She was a beauty. But she was one of the boys, if you know. Wherever high went, she went. Yeah. It was typical uh, Palmachnik way of life. Is uh, is he a person that you also kept in contact throughout the years? Chaim Barlev, like Mota or less? We had meetings until Chaim Barlev went on in the army to become chief of staff. Of course. Yeah. So uh, we didn't have contact with Mota. We had more contact because he was uh, he was there. And I went to his wedding. Chaim Barlev, I didn't go to his wedding. Okay, okay I understand. I understand. Uh, of course, uh, Chaim Barlev went on also to be the chief of staff of the Israeli, uh, Israeli oh, uh, of the IDF and also went into politics uh, briefly. I don't think any of them were very successful in their pol in politics, a little less, but they were definitely military career people. The Barlev line in the Suez Canal is mm -hmm. named after Chaim Barlev. Right. Very notorious figures in the history in the, of, of the Israeli of Israel. army. Yes, very, very. And I think it's very fascinating that you had the opportunity to serve under both of them directly. That's right. I think that's very, very fascinating. And I'm glad that we talked a little bit about them. Okay, so now we're going to continue. And after going through the notes that I've made here, and here we go. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read some stuff, and we're going to talk about it, just like we did yesterday. I'm going to read some stuff from your book, and we're going to open it up. Okay? So I need you to... The sexy part you don't Exactly, know. exactly. So here we have an, um, a thing that I'm reading from your book. The one thing we feared the most when we went out on a raid was... Um, on a raid was to encounter landmines. That's right. To protect, to protect us, we would take bags, fill them with sand, and put them on the floor of the Jeep. This added weight, but it made us feel more secure. Can you explain that to me? Well, I've got to explain to you, really. I've got, I've got a friend who lives in America. One of the Machal boys, he lost his leg, yeah, on a mine. Now, when Al lost his leg, thank God that we had the sandbags there. If we didn't have the sandbags, he would have been dead. Okay. The sandbags took the, most of the shrapnel and the blast away. So that's how Al stayed with his leg. I speak to him on the phone every now and then. What's his name? Al Twersky. So basically what you guys would do is you'd, you'd take sandbags, put them on the floor of the Jeep, probably under where you're On the half-tracks half too. On the half-tracks too. Was there a really, there was a big problem with mines, is that true, in, in, in the negative? Always. Always. Mines are always a thing that you don't know about. Minefields are terrible things because no one remembers where they were. Like, I always take the, with the Egyptians, we had a problem. That's where Al lost his leg. We went into the, uh, 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 to, uh, to the, uh, we made a raid into the Egyptian airfield at El Arish. And we captured a whole bunch of Egyptians with a brand new Fiat. With a brand new? Fiat. They had a Fiat vehicle. A Fiat. A Fiat. And they were, we didn't know it then, 
they were, they were laying mines where we captured them. And we captured them and took them. Why? The next day, and when I, tra I traveled behind them, so I remember, they took paper, they tore, tore paper up and threw it away. This was the, the outlay of the mines. I didn't know it then, no one knew it. But the next day, we went out there again, and Al Lander and the miner lost his leg. Now, if we would have thought a little bit further that they had, that we didn't think the Egyptians would, would be that advanced that they make uh, maps. Map, maps of where they lay their mines. Interesting. So the sandbags were put on the jeeps and the half tracks? Twice I landed at the mines, and thanks to the sandbags, nothing happened. The wheel blew off, the this blew off, but the, the shrapnel didn't get through. The sandbags ate them. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Now we're going to talk about a commando raid that you talk about here. And this is, this is a, little bit of, a, lot of, a little bit of reading that I'm going to be doing here, but I want you to think about... Think about one of the most interesting commando raids I took part in was on an attack to blow up the railway line between Gaza and Khan Yunus. Um, do, you, do you remember this, this raid? Do you want me to continue reading or can you tell me about it? I can tell you about it. You can remember, read it to remind me of it. Okay, I'll do that. We were 12 Jeeps and two armored cars. That's right. We started moving. We lined up in the straight line. We were about 10 meters to 12 meters, even more, apart 20 meters. So we formed a front and we moved forward and opened up, open up with the machine guns at the bottom, at the front. Okay, can you, can you tell me about this, this railway line between Gaza and Khan Yunus? Why was it so important to raid it? The Egyptian army was using it to supply their, their troops. They came from Egypt and the railway line came from Egypt. So it came straight from Egypt to Gaza. So they were using it, we blew it up. It was their supply system. We also, the Egyptians had fixed positions. Right. So we'd attack their fixed positions, or we'd go through, through their positions and they would shoot over us. We'd go in the wadi, and the Egyptians would be shooting up top there, above us. It said here also that you, you, you guys with your jeeps, you would change positions all the time so that the Egyptians would think that you guys are more. That's right. That there was a tactic that you used to deceive them, thinking that they would, that they would maybe retreat or they would get scared and run away. We, this was a tactic that you guys used with your jeeps. We used with our jeeps. We attacked from two sides, one same side. So one jeep went that way and opened up fire, then came the other way, then fired from the back. Mm -hmm. they could, it, it was difficult for them to estimate how many we were. Listen, we were very good at commander raiding. Okay. We were copy, we were used to, used to say, we used to say, Popsky Private Army, you heard of it? No. It was a Polish group that fought in, in the Western Desert in World War II. Popsky was the general, and he, he formed this group, and you had the Long Range Desert Group. You heard of that? Mm -hmm. They, they worked on the same system, behind the enemy line, shooting them up and running. And that's what we did. We went into the camps, we shot them up and ran like hell. It says here, we had to keep a straight line so that we would not advance in front of the jeeps next to us. That's My job right. as a driver was to keep the jeep in a straight line with the jeeps on the other side of me. That's it, right. It was a quite of a sight, seeing of the machine gun firing with their with their tracker bullets at night, a bit fireworks, like, a bit like fireworks. It was fireworks. I remember that very well. And and still more so when the machine gun gun at the back of the jeep opened fire over my head. That's right. And and the bullets were falling on my helmet. Tuck, 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 tuck. The, the the jackets. Yeah. Yeah, they were falling all because you. They were thinking of my, my, my helmet. What was the big gun that you guys had in the back? What kind of, what was it called? What? 
The, the gun that you had in the back of the Jeep? We had an ordinary machine gun. What, what was it called? What machine gun was it? Uh, 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 MG, the, the uh, German machine gun. German? Spanda. Spando. What, what caliber were the bullets? Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, oh, 05? No, seven, uh, seven, nine. Seven, six, nine. Seven, six, seven, six, nine. seven. Seven, six, like a Kalachnikov. Like the same kind of, okay, I understand. I understand. No, the Kalachnikov is smaller. Okay, it's a smaller gun, but I don't, okay, the caliber might be the same. After a while, back, um, after a while, the back machine gunners started shooting over my, over our heads. I put my helmet on quickly as all the empty, as all the empty cartridges were falling on me. Our aim was to get to the railway line and blow it up. Um, as the going was slow and we realized we could not reach our objective and return before daylight, we were given orders to turn around and work our way back to the road. The 12, the 12, the, the 12 back machine gunners of the Jeep now fired to give us the cover as we moved towards the road. On the road, they had blown up the trucks and laid mines on the road. We retreated along the same road we came, we came in with no casualties. At daylight, as daylight approached, we split up and moved back into our, into our camping sites. But we laid, we laid mines. We laid mines. You know what mines we laid? No. Our own patent. What's that? You had wire with a bump in the middle, like this, you know, two wire, and you would have a bump here. And the two, the, the two, every 10 centimeters, you had this wire, and if you stepped on it, it activated, it touched the two wires that could get the explosion going. And we used the, we used to put a t an empty, they had empty tins and boxes. We'd fill them up with, with uh, uh, TNT or something like that, or with, my, or with hand grenades or things, and tie them together and put them on the side of the road and then put this little wire on the road and cover it half with sand so that any vehicle that came would function it. So this specific operation, you guys did not blow up the railway line because of the time consideration and... We blew up off... Uh, this specific, I went this on specific, this specific very, uh, I went on so many raids on that type of thing. Right, I understand. But it says here in, in your book that you guys didn't blow it up, but you laid mines and you guys had no casualties. That's right. Which is a very important thing. Mm -hmm. Not to have any casualties. Okay, so now, okay. Annabelle, do you want something to eat with no, me? No, I have a piece of cake here. You Don't you, you want, want to eat with too. me? Don't you want to eat with me something? I'll eat with you, yeah. Sandwich? Sure, of course. Okay. Let me tell it to make it. Okay. Annabelle! Annabelle! What do you got for lunch? Lunch? What do you got? What do you want to make us? Bacon and eggs. You eat bacon, a kosher dicker bacon. If I had bacon, you'd have it. <laughs> <laughs> Annabelle, what are you going to make us for lunch? Moving, we're going to continue. And this is the third part of your book. This is the third chapter. And the title of the chapter is The Second Truce, October 15th, 1948 and on. So basically from here on, we're getting to the end of the war. Okay? And it says, after the capture of Beersheba, which we already talked about, we were all, uh, we all in old houses, many rooms, courtyards, we used as our base. Each Jeep platoon, consisting of more than less 12 boys, was given a house. Um, we, uh, we rounded up a lot of good things from the Egyptians' uh, stores 
and it, which made life easier for us. We found plates that we could eat on. Um, we found a lot of halva, sweet halva, decent uh, bully beef, and other canned foods. <clears throat> we broke into the, the, the shops. I, my job, my job, so I, wrote, I wrote there, I think. Yeah. My job was to break down the doors, and everyone would run over me and take. I managed to get a couple of pairs of socks. <laughs> Tell me about this, uh, you know, you're going into Beersheba, the Egyptians ran away. Beersheba at the time, describe to me Beersheba at the time, it's small, it's like a few... A few streets, yeah. that's all. Yeah. We had one street we had to clean up by shooting up the mines, I think I wrote yes, about you, that. you told me about that. Beersheba was our home base afterwards. So you're talking about... <clears throat> going into stores, busting down doors, and basically taking food and t tell me about this. This is a, this is food and socks. We what we needed. We uh, what did we need? A clean pair of socks, underwear. <laughs> What's it? That's what we took. What else? Could, you couldn't carry any, anything else we wanted to take. We had a, be, well, before we we, we we put things on our jeeps and took things. And then we said, we're going into action. They threw all the junk away. All the stuff we looted, we couldn't take with us. We didn't know where to keep it. So we threw it away. So when we left this area, we left with a lot of uh, stuff that we looted. But when you're talking about looting, you're not really talking about like... No, we're looting. taking what we need. Yeah, like supplies. Not, you're not talking about furniture. We didn't come there tables. to loot. No, no, no. no. What, what, what we did do, when we went into the to fi final basis i had we had a little he went through the the the, the camps and he used to be our schnorrer you know what i mean no he'd go out and, uh, and find things so he'd break into the arab houses and come back with plates to eat and knives and forks to make our life comfortable he, yeah. he, he took things for us yeah and that was his job, and he did it really well. And he was a typical Shoah concentration survivor. camp survivor. Do you remember his name? Don't remember. It says here also, it was in Beersheba, that I got my first revolver. I found the revolver on, on, on a wall. On a wall? Yeah. I think I wrote about it. Tell me about it. it. I don't remember exactly. We found it lying on a wall a revolver. It was a, a British revolver, the Enfield, which is a British Army revolver. Uh, six bullets. Nine mil it was a 38. Nine millimeter and 38 of the same. And. Uh, that revolver was my first revolver, and I also carried the same with the revolver. was always a backup. I believed in it. I always had a knife, a revolver, and then I had my normal machine gun, which could either be, I carried a Tommy gun, I carried Sten guns. I always had more than one weapon, and I normally used to carry a rifle with a bayonet, because a rifle with a bayonet gave me distance. A Sten gun gave me short distance. So I was very conscious of that, but growing up with guns in my life in Africa gave me a very good background for the army. I felt quite at home. Sure. I used to go hunting a lot in Africa. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it says here that it was an Enfield gun. Yeah, Enfield rifle. Which I took off of an Egyptian. That's right. So not off of a wall, off of an Egyptian. Egyptian. Probably a dead body. I don't know if he was dead or alive. When you're in the army, you, you loot automatically. Sure. It's not looting, it's taking what you need. Exactly. Looting is something completely different. Looting is going into people's houses and taking their furniture and looking for their gold and look, 
And uh, you took what you need yeah, for the food. The, food. You need, you, you, you're on the you're on the you're on the move. Absolutely, right. it's normal. I know soldiers that used that did that in Lebanon, in villages, that they went into people's houses, people ran away, and they ate. Of course. And then they kept on going. I did that. Yeah. In Lebanon. Yeah. We'll get to Lebanon. Believe me, we'll get to Lebanon. Um, there's 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 um there's a place here that I am and I, when I'm going through this book, there's a place here called. The Egyptians were now holding a place called Bir Asul Asulug. It's a place. Bir. Bir Aslug. 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 What is this place? Where is it? It's in Sinai. Okay. Bir Aslug was was a little village in Sinai. Bedouin or or Egyptian? Egyptian, look, the Bedouins, there weren't very many Bedouins. The Egyptians are little villages. Bedouin, we captured it. Abu Gila we captured. We'll get to that. Okay. Let's just see how we're doing here with tape. Okay, we have... Okay, I'm going to stop the tape right here for a second. We are going to. I just want to mention that we're continuing on. Uh, this is the same interview uh, on the 16th of December 2014. It's Tuesday. This is our third meeting with with uh, with David Migdal Tepperson, and we're continuing on. the The card ran out, and I just refilled it. So. You're okay? <laughs> We're good. So let's continue. When we sat together in the evening, or at, or at any other time for the matter, the main subjects of discussion would always be either war stories or women, as we were a bunch of horny men. A lot of our stories were big sex stories. Erwin, after the, after the, after the in incident, asked us not to talk about sex because he got excited. His wound would become painful, even with all the bad You know what, what happened with Erwin? Okay, so. I, I think I wrote about it. How he burnt, burnt his prick. We're going to talk about that right now. We, we, we captured Beersheba. Right. And each machlaka got a house. And we were having... Uh, I mean, we would sit down and eat at night uh, in, in, in that, like an Arab house, you know, with a lot of rooms uh -huh. and in the middle of the courtyard. And the courtyard, we'd have our meetings, our machleka and machleka bet on the other side. And, and a campfire probably, right? You in Beersheba. Yeah, you guys make a fire. That, 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 that's where we lived. That uh -huh. was our camp. But we'd had a little battle going between ourselves. We'd take smoke bombs and throw them into each other or take just the, these noisy bombs, boom, 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 to scare the others. So we had that little battle going on. Irwin... Where was Irwin from? South Africa. He was a horny bastard. <clears throat> he was, when he was 14, he joined the South African army of 16, 17, and went to Italy. He was a baby with the Italians. And he went to, they took him to all the prostitute houses and everything, so he had a lot of experience in life. And he was a horny bastard. <laughs> you got him going any time. And Irwin had taken, we would, we would be living in an Arab house with a yard, and we'd throw smoke bombs at each other, or oh, these bang bang bombs. So Irwin took, took the, the smoke bomb, pulled the pin, but it has two pins. He thought it's the, it's, the, it's the first pin, it was the second. So the thing blew and burnt his prick. Burnt his pants and his prick. It wasn't hurting, but it was burnt. So from then on, Irwin said, don't. Because he'd get horny, he was a horny boss. So he, he, 
don't talk about woman or sex. <laughs> With the woman around. He, he said he could get, get you, and he could get going really easy. We talk about her when we were sitting. And he said, stop talking, and it'd go up automatically. <laughs> and then it'd be painful for him. Of course. <laughs> and we were doing it out of spite. <laughs> he would fuck anything that moved. Anything that moved. He didn't care. No, he would. As long as it had a pulse. <laughs> they, I mean, he grew up at the beds or not in Italy as a youngster. So, so tell me a little bit about if you guys weren't on uh, in, uh, on a commando raid while you're in Beersheba, you guys at night, you guys are hanging out and and talking and cooking if you can with what you can and you know and just like tell me a little bit about the 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 avira, the the atmosphere between you guys, the com camaraderie. Um, you that know, was your only family. You came as a volunteer, you're by yourself, you've got no family, your family are the guys. The Hevla. It meant a lot to you? It's comradeship. You in the army, you know what I mean. Thank God that Palmach atmosphere has continued in the army. Even today, you take the youngsters, they got this comradeship. If you take the youngsters today in the army, exactly the same. I mean, you spend three years together with people. Sure. You'll get something clear. And the guys that you're with are all Mahal, most Mahal people. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. So English is what's being... Uh, I, you mentioned um, there's something here that I want to talk to you about. Uh, so we talked about the story with Erwin and his thing being burnt, which I'm sure is very painful. Um, after, after we captured Beracheva, the armored cars and some half-tracks were sent up, uh, north uh, towards Hebron. Uh, there, we there we blew up a bridge to prevent right. the Jordanians and the Egyptians from coming across to attack Beersheba. The bomb bomb was killed. Company commander Gershon... But the bomb bomb. The bomb bomb. Why, why was he called the bomb bomb? That was his nickname. Why? I never know. You never knew. Um, the bomb bomb... Uh, the bomb -bomb he, but he was, was a very... Palmach. Was, was he a, a Sabra? He was, he was a Palmach man. Was he a Sabra or a Machal person? No, no, he wasn't Machal. He okay, was he a was Sabra, Sabra. Sabra. Okay. The Bamba was a good leader and he had a good name. We were a small group and very family conscious. So everyone was <clears throat> stuck together. That's the night I drove a Jeep. As fast as it could go. Tell me, that's what I want. I've told you that, that story. No, that, you that's a lot. No. That, I told that, that, yeah, that night they called us out. My G company ex, ex, We yeah, took the ambulance. the ambulance. What happened to him? How did he get injured? They went to blow up the bridge towards Hebron. And he, he was shot by a, 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 a sniper, an Egyptian sniper with an 05 bullet that made a big hole. And uh, he was a leader. And we, on that night, I remember, I drove, I drove the ambulance as fast as my Jeep could go. No, you drove your Jeep escorting the ambulance. That's right. As fast as my Jeep could go, the bum bum, and he died afterwards. But uh, he was a leader, the Hevra. The bum, the bum bum died on the way back. That's right. From Bersheva, we went out on small missions, such as the capture of a place called Kun, Kulnub, Kulnub, which today is the city of Dimona. That's right. Was a small police station That's where right. the Egyptians kept some troops That's right. and a radio communications. As and soon, as we, as top, soon as we opened fire, the Egyptians ran away. They ran down. The, who are these Egyptians? They were Bedouins in the Egyptian army. They didn't want to get involved. So they ran down into the Wadi, right down the bottom, towards the Dead Sea. So the kibbush of Dimona was, you could have done it with your eyes closed. That's right. You fired a couple of shots and they disappeared. 
They were Bedouins that floated around. They put them in the Egyptian army at the police station. But they were primitive. So what else you want to know? No, we're just, you know, talking about this... Uh The Israeli army intelligence operated in, in original ways to obtain information from Bedouins in the area. Our four jeeps, our four jeeps had ex ex uh, uh, escorted four others, four others belonging to brigade headquarters to a Bedouin attached to, to a Bedouin attachment where one suspected a Bedouin was supposed to be hiding. We were given orders to look for him. Being as tall as I am, I could look over a wall, and I saw him hiding under a pile of wood. The intelligence officer spent some time questioning him, and suddenly, beck uh, suddenly beck beck around in me to come beck around in me to come over. He then told me to take out a large commando hunting knife. Put my mouth. Tell me the story. He told the story. I came. I had a beard. He must look what I looked like. I'm six foot six. I want you to tell me the story with the intelligence officer. Basically, what is going on here is that he's getting using me as information. Tell me to get the power. Now, what did he do? He told them that I my, my hobby was collecting balls. Testicles. Testicles. And I love to collect them. I used to dry them out and hang them. They told them all type of stories that the Egyptians could. Sorry, continue. Okay. He told them all type of stories that... Stop playing with my toots. Okay, sorry. I'm fixing your microphone. <laughs> he told them all type of stories to get them scared of what's them about me. One of the stories they told about me, that my hobby was collecting penises and balls, and I loved it, what's them. So they told me, put my knife in my mouth and just stand there. And then they told me to pick him up. They, they tried to get him to talk, they wouldn't talk, what's them? But over the first, they put the, the, the shirts in him by telling stories about me. So then they told me, I'm very strong. He says, pick him up and put him on the jeep. So he says, he loves to collect balls. So I put my arms around and pick him. He started screaming, come in, come in. Yeah. He started screaming. You can't believe the scream. I never forget those screams they were. Because they told him all type of stories about what I'm going to do. To him. And I didn't know. I didn't know Hebrew. You had no idea what they were talking about. Was uh, like, and yeah. he was he just shitting himself that I'm going to cut his balls off. <laughs> he was so certain I'm going to wipe him off the map. Let's stop now and eat yes, something. We're going to stop and eat. Okay. We are continuing. So basically, what's happening now is you guys are at a place called En Husop. En Husop. En Husop. Can you tell me roughly where that is today in our in our map of it's Israel about, and Negev? It's about twenty kilometers into Sinai into Sinai, because here it says that it's near the Jordanian border, Ein Husop. Where's Sinai? Ein Husop, H-U-S-S-O-P. That's right. Ein Husop is the name of the village. After the capture of Ein Husop, the Negev, the Negev Brigade had, had brought down the 7th Palmach Infantry Battalion which also I had a lot of that had a lot of machal 
um, volunteers, including some South Africans, as well as some Chinese Jews, the, volunteers from Shanghai. That's right. The Shanghai boys. The UN came to inspect the line where we were holding as three minefields, uh, they were holding uh, as three were minefields on the road going south. They wanted to see where our positions were, how far south they extended. So some of our jeeps uh, uh, escorted them a long way around the minefields. Well, the other but other jeeps traveled through the minefields, climbing up the hill, uh, hoisted our flag. When the United Nations arrived, they weren't allowed to come close. But they could see our positions and marked it on the map. Again, they would go all around. We would take them around and we would get the same people that held the line. It was a small group that the, that, that the United Nations... We took her down this way with escort. We would go straight. What they actually saw was the same small group everywhere. They saw about 20 different positions, and all of them were the same people. So you were like, uh, you were... Uh, bluffing them. Bluffing them. Of course. Why were you bluffing the UN? We had to prove to them that we, that we were... We, the, the Jordanians came out in the army that, it, that we brought down a whole brigade down there. We were brought down the same people all the time. It's a small company, even not a, a company group. So you were um, using methods of deception? Deception, of course. We had to prove, we did another thing. We used to go up the road all the way on the Jordanian border and we'd go without lights from a lot, go up, turn around, come back with lights. And they, that's when they wrote in the, in the, in the British paper that, 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 that Israel had moved a whole brigade into that area with the same jeeps all the time. So basically what you guys were doing with the UN and the Jordanians... Is we were decepting them. We had to. We had, we had no powers. And whose idea was this? Mm. Whose idea was this? Whose idea was this? It's tactic. It's a brilliant tactic. No yeah. one's idea. We just did it. I didn't. You don't ask anyone whose idea it is. No, I understand. I understand. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> It says here, we knew that the UN uh, observers were spies for the British and the French, That's right. who in turn w were allies with the Arab armies that attacked us. So you guys were hostile towards the UN, and the UN was hostile towards you. It was no love affair. No love affair. How did Ben Gurion say, um shmum? The whole country was hostile towards them because they were hostile towards us, and we knew they were spies for the British. The British wanted to keep the whole of Palestine and Jordan under their command. Yeah, you had the little Israel there disturbing their, their position. And? Mm. And <clears throat> do you remember any encounters with the United Nations there, like personal encounters, you dealing with them, talking to them, because you spoke English, or you just, no, nothing, no communication, here, 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 like, just... Spies for the Egyptians. No, no, no. Well, you, I, I think I wrote about it in the book everywhere. 
About what? About the United Nations yeah, and all that. Yeah, that's, that's where I'm. That's where I'm. <laughs> okay. Now we're getting to Operation Chorev. This is the big operation. In the south. In the south. Which you we went all the way down to Eilat. Exactly. We're gonna, now we're going <clears> to <throat> we're gonna talk about that in depth. Okay. Mifta Chorev. Okay. I'm going to read you something. And you tell me what you remember. <clears throat> we started preparing our vehicles for the big push south. Two days before the battle, our prime minister came to see us off. Who? Our prime minister came to see us off. That was Eshkol? I don't remember. Ben Gurion. Oh, Ben Gurion, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. I can't remember that. But he came to say hello. We took pictures and that's it. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember him coming. Ben Gurion was a character. Once you saw him, you remembered. <laughs> yeah, but he had uh, this wild hair of his. We had admired him. We all the boys liked him. Why should I remember? He, he, he to me he was a small god. <coughs> he had leadership in him automatically. Do you know this for a fact or for just for reading about him and from what what I this is my personal opinion. I mean I, I'd follow him. And not only me, all the boys. He had automatic leadership. Now when he came to, to talk to you guys before this big operation, I need you to try and think to try and think not word for word what he said, but why did he come down there to see you guys? Why was it the whole battalion, or was it just Chayot Negev, or who did he come to see off? Who was Ars Ben Gurion. What's that? Ars Ben Gurion. What are you asking me for? Because you were there. Yeah, but I was there on, on the side of saying hello. That's all. Yeah. I don't know what he did. Did he shake his hand or no? No. Nah. No. He was just. A... Yes. Listen, we all admired him. Thought he's a leader. Now explain to me what, in your words, in your rec 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 recollection, what was Mivtza Chorev? What was the purpose of the Mivtza? Because up until now, you're going here, you're going there, you're doing this, you're all in the negative. To capture Eilat. We went all the way down to Eilat and we captured Eilat. We opened the negative to the Israeli. When we got to Eilat, Alexandro, uh, 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 what they call it, not Alexander. Uh, Golani. Huh? Golani. Golani. Golani went one way and the Palmach went the other way. And when we captured Eilat, we sent uh, Golani and, uh, 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 and, uh, and Chayota Negev sent a cable to the, to, 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 to the president, Chativata uh, Negev, and Golani present you with Eilat. We present Israel with Eilat. Okay. In the morning, okay, here's, uh, here's, um, some regulations of what you were talking about. This is all in. This is all in. Now we're all in the in the uh, in the Mifza. In the morning, the Egyptians ran away, and we captured a four armored cars and trucks, lobbed with luxuries like cigarettes and f and good food. Mm -hmm. um, this is near a place called Masrafa. Exactly. Where is this? Where is this? This is in the Sinai. This is what's what's this place? What's it called? Mas Masrafa. Masrafa. It's in the South Negev. In the South Negev. 
is it like a police station? It's Ayom. It's it's called Mitzpeh Shifta. <clears throat> Shifta. Mm -hmm. Shifta was a village. It's a Mitzpeh. It's above. When you go down to Eilat, you know, down that way. After I say, uh, Malaya Krobim. Malaya Krobim. You know where yeah. Malaya Krobim is? Yeah. Uh, it's above that. You had to go down there to get to Eilat. We went down. Shifta was all part of that. Was there a battle there or you just captured it? I won't say a battle, they ran away. They ran away. So I'm a little bit confused. The Egyptians, were, were they a, a force to be reckoned with or are they just running away all the time? They were a force. When they were stuck in, they fired and they watched them. They didn't just run away all the time. But uh, ooh, ooh. They, they didn't even know what they're fighting for. Why should they fight for the Palestinians? That I had from Egyptian prisoners telling me. Really? Yeah. <clears throat> Just gonna try something here. Just see how this works. What, you're giving me more light? Yeah. Not enough light? Yeah. What light can Where I help I? put on? No, no, it's good, I got this. Let me just see this for a second. That's a very powerful battery. Yes, it is. Someone arrived, yeah. Annabelle! 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 Is that okay? Hmm? Is that okay? Okay. Yeah? So you're telling me about the, about the Egyptian soldiers, that they're, they didn't even know why they were fighting for the Palestinians. They didn't like the Palestinians. <clears throat> our jeep, our jeep company now formed up to lead the brig, the brigade across to the across the border into the Sinai. We were given two armored cars, and started feeling our our way towards the main Egyptian crossroads called Abu Agila. Agelia. Agelia, Agelia, Abu Agelia. After we crossed the border, traveling slowly forward, we saw, we saw our Spitfires fly over us. We were very happy to see them, but suddenly they turned and shot our leading vehicle and our last vehicle, mistaking us for Egyptians. The reason for this, for this was that our armored car leading us still carried its original Egyptian markings because it's, you guys we uh, captured, we them. captured it. And at the end of the convoy, we still had a small supply truck also with original Egyptian markings. They realized their mistake after their first run. I, Both pilots were South African and right. friends of mine. That's I told right. them afterwards that we, I told them afterwards that we were about 14 South African boys in that convoy. That's right. What the hell happened? We had captured the Egyptian vehicles and we were traveling with them in our convoy. And they saw these Egyptian vehicles with the signs of the Egyptian army on their roof. Why didn't you guys take off those insignias? We didn't even think of it. Who thinks of it? You capture a vehicle, you take it. You don't think you're going to take the insignia. We didn't think our own air force was that good. Because they never saw them. You forget that uh, the, we didn't have much action. They were for shooting when we did. See, they went into Egypt and shot up Egypt, but we didn't see our air force. Was that the first time you were ever fired on from friendly fire? Uh, there were two, three times out there besides that. You, in the war, you you. How should I put it? You shoot first and ask afterwards. That's the trouble, you know what I mean? 
You see it in all, right, every war that's been fought. Your own troops shoot your own troops. Shalom, give it it. Come here. So, this is a kind of a crazy incident that you're being fired on from your own Air Force because you guys forgot to take off your, the Egyptian... Uh, Not only that, the, we were advancing much faster. The, 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 the Air Force knew that anything, they had orders to shoot up everything in Sinai. Uh -huh. And we were deep in Sinai already. But no one notified the Air Force that we were in Sinai. And of course, you don't have uh, radio contact. You know, you, you don't have it. But the, didn't that would bother me? An incident like that. That would really bother me. That my own forces are shooting on me. To what? What can you do? You get shot at. The Egyptian. Um, early in the morning, the, uh, the, uh, when the Egyptian position outside Abu Agila. Abu, Ag Abu Agela. Agela opened fired on the lead armor car, knocking it out. That's right. They killed the boy. So you guys are on your way to Abu Agila to, to, to conquer it. Is it a village? Is it a police station? Is it a, a fortified? What is, what's there? They had a better one village. Nothing. So Abu why do you need to take it? We took it. Why? If it's nothing, then why do you need to take it? Because it had an Egyptian army uh, 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 post there, army post. It was my only army. That's why we took it. It says here, Abu Agila, the Egyptians surrendered at Abu Agila. Abu Agila cons consisted of a small village and a prison camp of Egyptian political prisoners. That's right. It also housed a large <clears throat> army camp, a large army camp. There was a lovely bridge across a dry river. That's right. And a dam in, in, uh, uh, in, the, dam in the, the dry gov river. The governor's house dam. So it wasn't just, it was a big deal, the place. <laughs> prison camp, army base. This was the, the, the ad, admin, admin administration of Sinai. Okay. Who's this? Excuse me. I've got to, I'm being watched by a woman. I'm, I, it's a, take your glass off. Oh, now I can see who it is. I don't understand. Boka Tov Yalda. Look what he's doing to me. Help, help. Really? Can you see me with the light? He's making me more beautiful. Mm -hmm. Don't make me over beautiful. Really don't fall in love with me. Okay. <clears> How? <throat> you won't allow me to come. <laughs> you won't allow me. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Okay. Okay. Um, the Egyptian trucks coming from Egypt, not knowing that we had captured Abu Agila, That's right. traveled into the town and waved to us as if we were Egyptian soldiers. That's right. They soon found themselves as POWs. That's right. We were sent to, to mop up the Egyptian soldiers from the surrounding hills and bring them into the POW camp. My G, my G platoon captured a small group of about 40 prisoners. My, my, and my officer told me to escort them back to, back to Abu Agila on foot. They lay down on the ground refusing to go with me as I looked terrifying with all of the weapons that I had in my beard. This is how my friend Irwin tells the story. Okay, we're, we're gonna, you're gonna tell me the story. We, we talked about this. So the Egyptians just fall into your arms and they become POWs because they just go into the city and they don't, they don't know that the, that the city or the the area has been taken by the Israelis and they just fall right into your hands. They didn't fall that way, but they fell. <laughs> but they, they, they said, Allah, Allah, Allah. And then they, they, we, we, we told them, Erfindak, Allah. They were shocked, put it that way. All right, they prisoner of war, but they, uh, 
the, the officer told me to take them back to camp. This is where they come along, they lay on the ground, refused to go with me. And the main reason they refused to go with me, they, by looking at me, they were shit scared that I'd kill them. Okay. They were shit scared I was going to kill them, so they put that. Well, I looked terrible. Look, I had a big beard, full of food. I mean, I hadn't combed it out for a couple of weeks. And uh, I had red eyes, and I was muddy and dirty, and my clothes were, looked like I, I'm a wild animal. And uh, that's why they called us Hayota Negev. Why? Because we looked like Hayot. <laughs> and uh, I mean, if you take a look at me, I'm six foot six. I'm dressed like I'm a Schmeigeiger, like a, like a wild animal. I've got my, my Kovogel, if you remember what Kovogel is? Stuck on the top of my head. And I carried a, a sortie of weapons. And I had a big knife. I was, I was a vicious looking character. Yeah. And they refused. Some of the prisoners laid down on the ground refused to go with me. They thought I'm going to kill them. So they had to send a jeep with me. And I walked next to them and the jeep rode next to them <laughs> to prove to the Egyptians that I wouldn't kill them. How many were there? Were like 10, 20? Something like that. Something I like don't that? remember exactly. But all I know is from the stories that the boys told me that the, because I didn't speak Arabic, that they refused to go with me because I was going to slaughter them. First, they, they used me to get information. And they used to tell them I, that my hobby was collecting penises and balls. And uh, they would talk Arabic to them, and then they'd call me across here and say, pick him up, put him on the jeep. And he would start screaming like I said, why is he screaming? He says, because you're supposed to be taking, cutting his balls off any minute. <laughs> and of course, all these situations gave you a lot of uh, confidence. Oh, well, I was always very confident. I never, look, I'm, I'm lucky enough. Today I realize that I'm big. I never ha had fear. I never had, uh, I didn't know what fear was. Being big and being like I am, it helped me go through life. No one started with me. I mean, whatever I did, I did. And, but I, I got away with murder, but I didn't realize it because of my size. I didn't realize because of my size that I wasn't suffering like a Jew should suffer. If you know what I'm going to be going. When I shook hands with someone, I cracked his knee, I cracked his fingers to show how strong I am. And I gained the impression, it was when I was 15, some guy called me bloody Jew. Right. I told you the story. So this, story, this guy left me with a name. Uh, that, that's what I can tell you about. Okay. <clears throat> This is a very interesting story. Uh, so even though you, it says here that the, the battle for Al 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 Abu Gela. Abu Gela still, it said the attack continued with the help of the 8th Brigade tanks towards the town of El Arish. Mm -hmm. At the entrance of El Arish, there was a large airfield. Do you remember this airfield? My friend the lost lead, his leg there. The lead the lead uh, Sherman tank hit a mine, and it, and and it had to be it had to be destroyed. Hit a mine and it had to be destroyed. The airfield, where we discovered a Spitfire, that seemed to be in perfect condition. An Egyptian Spitfire. 
a South African pilot named Boris Senior. Exactly, was brought down to try and fly it out. He didn't succeed. We put it on a truck and we sent it across the border. How do you put a plane on a truck? You lift it with all the boys around. I think I wrote that. Yeah, t t tell me about what you remember. I'll, 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 um... uh, we lifted it and then we, we dragged it behind the jeep on the back, from the back wheel. And the jeep would travel and we'd watch it and see it wouldn't get fall off the road. <laughs> but we took it just across the border and left it on the other side. So if there was a piece, at least we had the jeep, the, the Spitfire. So the Egyptians left this plane mm -hmm. and you guys towed it 20 kilometers, it says here? That's right. It says, that, uh, uh, it says here that you found it at El Arish, you towed it back to Abu Aguila. That's right. And then from Abu Aguila, to it, the was border. Taken, no, it was taken by a truck to Tel Aviv. That's right. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a, a good prize. No, they took it firstly across the border. Put it left in the, after it was taken by a truck. Why? We had to put it in the Israeli side because we knew they were going to become a peace fire, uh, ceasefire. And if we didn't have it on our side, we couldn't get it. So we had to drag it to our side so that when the peace ceasefire came, the border was the border and anything on our side was ours. Listen, uh, what, uh, Shalal Milchama, what do you call that? Shalal Milchama. Shalal it's a great milchama. Shalal, a plane. Then, it's then, great. Then, that's then, like, uh, then, that's yeah. like uh, you guys must have been pretty happy that you guys managed to, well, uh, and you said it was in good condition too. Yes, you know, in ni till 1950, you know what happened with the Air Force. There were no Israeli pilots. I understand, but that's not connected to what we're talking about right now. But yes, I know this. I know, I know. I definitely know this. What I'm trying to, I'm just trying for you to tell me the story of this plane because I think it's, in a, it's a great story. Um, that, uh, that, uh... No, you dragged it across the border, of course. Was it hard to drag it across the border, these planes? Well, we, we had a, a jeep the, the tied jeep. to the back wheel and pulling it, and the driver had the problem of, of, of the tail hitting his head. So he bent down and we, we escorted him to see that it got there. How long, do you remember how long it took you guys? Nah. Half a day, a day. I don't remember. It says here, my platoon was sent to patrol along the no man's land area. As we came closer to the Egyptian lines, we stopped a whole Egyptian column on the road towards Abu Aguila. Mm -hmm. It consisted of armor cars in the lead and trucks full of infantry and artillery mm -hmm. follow, uh, following. This was definitely a force coming to attack. Counter attack. Coming to attack our positions at Abu Aguila. That's right. That's what I say, counter attack, yeah. They stopped about one kilometer short of us. Mm -hmm. The other three jeeps were running around in the wadis, driving up the hills and no. showing, showing what, up for a few what, minutes What each. we did is we split the jeeps. We'd go down the valleys and come up here. With our jeep, go down here and come up here. And the Egyptians stopped. They were a whole convoy. I remember I stood there and I counted the 70 some vehicles. Seventy? Coming. Yes, with soldiers and everything. And we had these jeeps coming up and down. They didn't know how many jeeps are there. How many? How 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 big our our our, our group was. And that's when they ret retreated. They packed up and went back. They thought they'd been spotted. The attack, the counter attack that was coming. And we and we followed them. And we still kept jumping up and down. We'd send a jeep up to the top of the hill, and they'd see. Or well, they'd go this way, oh, there's a jeep there on this hill, there's a jeep on this hill. We were running around with four jeeps, we were doing the work of tw 20. 
you had a disinformation, <laughs> giving them disinformation. And that was a tactic that was used a lot. It was you guys used it on the Jordanian border too. We used it everywhere. We had to, for instance, like uh, when we went down to Eilat, one of the tactics was to 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 drive out of Eilat at, at night as far as we could go, turn around, put our lights on and come back. And the British, I remember in the British newspaper was written, Israel had brought down our whole division, which was the same jeeps going back and forth. When we captured Abu Aguila, Motegur, who was a lieutenant in command of our four jeeps, had an argument with our battalion commander, Chaim Barlev. That's right. I can't clearly remember the row, but since my Hebrew was so bad at the time, I couldn't even understand what they were saying to one another. Both of these men later became chief of staff. Top. So they had uh, little issues with each other at this moment in the, in the battle. No, Matugu, yeah. I, I mean, Chaim Barlev was his, bo his boss. He disagreed with him, which is typical Palmach. I mean, in the army, you wouldn't have turned around and told your, your battalion commander, go and get fucked. <laughs> Excuse me, go and get screwed. Sorry, madam. So you're using bad language in your presence. But you, don't, you, you absolutely had no, no idea till today what that argument was about. I didn't know Hebrew. But it was definitely noticeable. You put it in your book. You put two, two people shouting at each other? and you don't know what's going on, so you write that. I mean, it, it caught my eyes. Was Motagor hot-tempered? Was he a hot-tempered guy? Cool. And my lab was still cooler. My lab was cold ice. Kept a straight face, cold, what's the name? Very good leader. Our next job was to destroy an Egyptian airfield on the way to Suez, on the, on the way to the Suez Canal, from which Spitfires were taking off and attacking us several times a day. That's right. According to POWs and our intelligence, there were only a few Egyptian soldiers guarding the airfield, and they had they had he and they had no heavy weapons. <laughs> but yet they had to, they had ak ak. They had 40 millimeters, they had 30 millimeters, they had every ACAC you could think of, and we had these red bullets coming at us from the ACAC. I was traveling in my Jeep with flat tires already, and you saw these weird red bullets coming at you, boom, and exploding next to you. So the intelligence was totally off. There was no intelligence. It says here, according to POW, to POWs and our intelligence, there were only ha there was only a few Egyptian soldiers guarding the airfield, and they had no heavy weapons. That's what I said. There was no intelligence. That's not intelligence. But someone's guessing. If we had intelligence, we would have known it. <clears throat> As so, you got you guys are going. You guys are now in 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 deep in the Sinai. Mm -hmm. You're near, you're near Suez, near mm -hmm. the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. That's pretty deep. Mm -hmm. That's when the British got fright and gave us 24 hours. We're going to get to that right now. As the, as, as the sun was setting in the west, it must have reflected something shiny from our jeep. Because suddenly I saw an army pick up... Come out of the airfield. And coming towards us. That's right. We took, our jeep company was waiting for night to make the raid, and they were covered in, in uh, uh, a camouflage netting, a whole company, and we had armored cars with us too. And the idea was to go in there and shoot up this whole airfield. And uh, <clears throat> because of the sun shining, 
they spotted someone of theirs on the light. So I remember when we saw them come out of the thing, my Jeep, I was sitting at the back. I couldn't load my gun because it was all a bala gun at the back. We were four of us there and we were travel we were on the spot to look and they'd spotted us and they came out with this this uh, van and the Egyptian was taking his gun and firing at us with his revolver through the back window, through the side window. What was the distance between you guys? Well, we were traveling in this jeep, was was heavy, and he was getting closer. But we went straight into, all our jeeps were standing ready for the night. We were supposed to attack at night. And they were all ready, and he went running back into them. When he, I've never seen a bloke turn around so quickly. This Egyptian, with his pickup, turned around on the spot, on the wheels, and drove our way. We were, we turned around into the sand and started firing from the front because our back gun didn't work. And uh, the, the, they went running back into the airfield and we followed them with our whole Jeep, Jeep unit. This is where we made the raid on them. I think I wrote all about that. We turned around and we did all that. The Jeep, we did a 180 degrees. Our Jeep did the same and then in front, and then the front gunner opened fire on them. Mm -hmm. as they escaped towards the airfield. Mm -hmm. As our vehicle was much slower um, than his, and, and the road was twisted and turned, it was difficult for us to catch him. Since the element of surprise had been lost for the attack on the airfield, we had no option but to start the attack. We reached the airfield, formed into 12 and charge and charge. Although it was still daylight, we spread out with our Jeeps, with all of our guns firing. There were five Spitfires, three of them took off and flew into the direction of Egypt. We hit the, two, we hit the remaining two aircrafts. As we neared the planes, all hell broke loose. What happened? The we opened fire and the uh, Egyptians had a lot of anti-aircraft. They lowered their guns and fired at us with these red bullets shooting. And we were with the jeeps and we were shooting and they were shooting. Commando attack. You fired everything you had and they fired everything you had. And we had flat tires already from shooting. They shoot your tires. Look, that's it. How did the battle end up? Mm -hmm. How did the battle end up? Well, we ran back. They ran this way, we ran that way. We did, it, it, it died down. But it didn't end up, it died down. But the Egyptians left afterwards. They pulled out. You're talking about Abu Ghela. No, right. we're talking about the airfield at Suez. Uh -huh. At Suez, we're at the Suez Canal now. We had no casualties, but later heard that the Egyptians destroyed the airfield and fled to Egypt. That's right. Because you guys discovered them, so there was no more nothing to fight. So that was your tactic: attack, run away, attack, run away, attack, run away, Come attack, on. run away. Come on, the battles. Yeah. You blast whatever you can blast, and they don't know what's coming at them. <clears throat> you want a coffee? You okay, want a coffee? Here, no, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. I'm very good. It says here, we started back to camp and met up with the small convoy of demolition men and their explosives. That night, our battalion commander told us that we would be staying in Abu Ghela. In Abu Ghela, correct, for a long time in order to block off any advances. In the middle of the night, they woke us up to tell us that the British had given us 12 hours to move out of Sinai, as, as we had come to we had come too close to the Suez Canal for their liking. I tried to explain this to me. The British went the Suez Canal. That was there. They didn't want us too close, and they gave us 12 hours to pull out. 
And we were used to Egyptian airplanes miles up. All of a sudden we hear airplanes, you couldn't see them, they were hedge hopping. Just above ground, two, three feet, meters above ground, and they were hedge hopping on us and came shooting over our heads. Now this was British Air Force, all the Egyptian. We pulled out. What could we do? They gave us 24 hours. 12. Uh, 12 hours, sorry. And we pulled out and we went back to, 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 the, to, to the Palestine side. That was it. The British, again. The British Empire of Britain. Early that morning, we heard airplanes. You know what happened? No. Our Air Force shot the hell out of the Egyptians. Why? Whenever they met, they shot. They were fired. Like Borosini and these. These were boys that fought right through World War II. Fighter pilots, the Battle of Britain and all that. And yeah, you put them in against these young Egyptians. It was like wiping the map. And they were flying old aeroplanes, and the Egyptians came there with new spitties. <laughs> Rina! How's your sheep? What, what, excuse me, what does it mean, head hopping? What does head hopping mean? What do you mean, head hopping? It says they're head hopping. Yeah, head, head, Hedge? Hedge hopping. Hedge hopping. The airplanes. That's when they fly very low? Yeah, they fly low and they go up the edge and lower the edge, up the edge. You have a, a high edge and the plane comes over and down. So it disappears behind the edge, up above the head. It's very low flying. Okay, we're, on, we're almost done for today. We're almost at the end of at the end of, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of the Mifta Chorev. The new ceasefire came into force and we pulled back to Beersheba. Okay? So now you're back in Beersheba after this whole, whole incident with the, at, this, at Suez and... With the Egyptian with border. The Egyptian border. You're back, you're back in... Uh, in Our base at Beersheba. One night, towards the end of February 1949, we were told that we were going to capture a lot and we were to pair the jeeps. We left that night. Traveling south, traveling, traveling south to Beersheba and, and continuing through the middle of the Negev, there were jeeps <clears throat> and command cars in our group. We, can, we, we continued to a very flat gravel area on top of the mountains between Arava Valley and the Egyptian border. This was a huge salt plain. We cleared the bigger stones away from the prepared uh, area for the, Air for, for the Air Force Dakota. Today it's the biggest Air Force base in the south. Excuse me? Today it's the biggest Air Force base in the south. It is of that, correct? That's right. So you guys were reinforced, you guys got reinforcements there. By the, by, it says here, by the Air Force Dakota supply planes. That's land. right. They brought in the 7th Battalion infantry from our unit. And we went down by jeep towards Eilat. The infantry that had arrived were put into some of the empty vehicles that the convoy had brought from had brought down. Um, from where we continued towards a lot, a small group of a, what is it? A small group consisting of our brigade commander and our battalion commander went through the Egyptian side. That's right. And even had coffee with the Egyptian the, soldiers. These Egyptian policemen, they knew the difference. They were Arabs, and you welcomed anyone. The whole mentality you must understand. These were Bedouins. Fadal. You know the mentality? So Chaim Bar Levin Motagur had coffee with him? Yes. As far as I know, I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I was on the border. The three Egyptian policemen obviously did not know that the war was a was the war was about probably could not even be they couldn't even read or write. Hopefully. We continued towards a lot. The whole way down, there were no roads. 
and we made our way through the wadis and hills according to our maps. Mm -hmm. The first dirt road we hit was the British convoy road from Egypt to Eilat to Transjordan. We took pictures. We took pictures of the of the mile of the mileage signs and the distance signs to Petra Amman, all written in English. By capturing Eilat, we had cut off the only road that the British had between Transjordan That's and the right. British troops in the Suez Canal. In Eilat, we found exactly three mud huts and a beautiful bay. As the water was really cold, very few of us went in for a swim. That's right. You, f you froze your balls off. If I say, you want to pee, you got to pee before you swim. After you swim, it's so cold that you can't pee. It's ice. <laughs> I stopped you. Anyway. Uh, I love. This is your first time there, probably, no? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. I've got pictures too, of us swimming in the nude and lot. Just ice cold water. <laughs> that I remember. I didn't have Rina around to heat me up. Tell, tell me about tell me about the tell me about uh, getting to a lot. Tell me about uh, about finally getting there. What do you mean finally get there? Got there. Okay, we get a lot. What can I tell you? We get to a lot, and and Bryn hoist the flag, climbed up the pole. Bren, remember light? He flies the fl he, he, he hoist the flag. The ink flag. Huh? Yeah, the, the ink. ink flag. Yeah. Were you there when they put it up or no? Yes. We captured a lot. We were there before before he came. He came afterwards. He came with the battalion commander. We ca we were the ones that captured it. The Plugat GP. Was there anything to fight for there or was there any They all got ran away. The Egyptians ran away. They crossed the border, the Ojanians crossed back into Jordan. So did the Egyptians. You had one side of Egypt and one side of Jordanian. So they both had where to go home. Not a bullet fired? Not that I remember. No, we know that we didn't fire. Do you remember those three little huts there? Yes, of course. I've even got a, the pictures. Uh, got pictures with the seventh uh, battalion came down infantry. They they, they marked in, in the mud there. Seventh battalion. That's our seventh battalion. We came down. They were our infantry. We we were on jeeps, and they came down to hold the place. Seventh battalion. When we first arrived in Elat. We had no flag. This is the story of the flag that you just talked about. Our main diet was made up of, of tinned food, biscuits, and a hot cup of coffee. If we had time to boil water, any food supplies captured from the enemy was always welcome, including chicken, sheep, and there was always a volunteer to cook or barbecue them. So the so basically, Nivtsa Chorev is over once a lot is captured. captured, and you're there. Yeah, and we sent a, a cable that Golani and Chativat and they gave present a lot to the state of Israel. There was a telegram sent like that. Do you and remember how many days you spent there in a lot? We slept behind the hill so the Egyptians couldn't, and we played this game with the lights up and down, and then we pulled out, but it wasn't very really long because they came down with uh, regular forces. And we were commando units. So we, re we were relieved after that a lot. It settled down to become a lot, if you know what I mean. They brought the doctors there, they brought the hospital there. So here's a very interesting thing that is happening. 
getting back to the camp at Tel Nof, a permanent base with a kitchen, hot food, and bread, and hot showers. It was a real holiday. In Tel Nof, we had a parade of our unit, which, was called, which, was, which we called the dismantling of the Palmach. It was taken by the fathers of the Palmach, Yitzhak Sadeh and Yigal Alon, and our brigade commander. They took the salute. Excuse me? They took the salute. Explain to me this. This is a very, very, very important... Well, you got it written there. What does it say? Excuse me? What did I write? I don't... Let me... Yeah, I, I... Basically, after the capturing of Eilat, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you go to Tel Nof, mm -hmm. where the... We had the parade. I don't know remember. What was the parade about? It was... A, the dismantling of the Palmach. The Palmach became part of the army. It was actually before that. But now officially it, was, it wasn't Palmach, it wasn't Etzel, it wasn't Lechim. It was army, Israel, one army. That's what Ben Gurion wanted. One army, one nation. That's it. And w this was a parade with Yitzhak Sadeh was there and he got alone. I, I carried the flag. Okay. I'm a big boy, so they gave me the flag. Which flag? The Palmach flag or the State of Israel? State of Israel. At this parade. Is there anything else you remember about this parade? Anything significant? Another parade. Uh, Benika, how's my little <coughs> pussy cat? Okay. We're, we're, done in, we're, we're done very soon. I was becoming a civilian and going into the reserves. It was important to know that the real war is not like in the movies. There's a fear, there is the fear, the excitement, the control of yourself, and you worry about your mates. All this is very difficult to explain to someone who has not had the experience. Well, you've been there, so you know. I understand, yeah. I've definitely been there. And My, I, how, do you, how do you say? A comradeship, I call it, which is, which is your family. The comradeship is your family, your closest family. No, that's it. So, after, let's just talk very briefly, after the war is over, the war is over in February, March of 1949. Sorry. Till today, the war's not over. I understand. To me, I did Miluim 50, 40, 60 days every day, every year. Every year. I did the, who patrolled the borders? Miluim Nikim. I did, I did the Gaza border, I did the Watem border, I did Gaza. All Miluim, all Miluim, 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 Miluim. But once the 1948 war is over, it's never over. But the 1948, the War of Independence, there was a ceasefire. Of course, there was a next war in 1956, but we're not going to get into that right now. The Palmach is put into to the IDF. There is no more Palmach. What does David do? Does he go back to South Africa? What's, what, where do you, like the war is over for now. Are you eager to go back to South Africa and start a new chapter in your life, or are you, what, what's going on in your mind? I stayed in Israel in the army in the meantime, and I was doing a lot of reserve duty on the borders. In the meantime, I, I, stay, I was sent to Pesach to my wife's house, and I married my wife, who was an Israeli. When did you meet your wife? Dur during the... I was sent there by the army as a lone soldier for Pesach. This is 1949? 49. Right after the, after... Uh, Within two months I was married. So as a Chayal Boded, you were sent to her, to her house for Seder, alone or with some other people? But I, no, I had another friend. Uh -huh. He went to the next door house. Okay. We both of us, two of us were sent to, to, to two families one next to another, that, that asked her to take in lone soldiers. Nice. That's how I met my wife. You met her at the Seder? Yeah. 
And her father decided as a good, nice Yiddish boy, he won't marry a guy, go and dig the mice. She, he put the cuffs on me. <laughs> and where did they live? In Ramat Gan. In Ramat Gan. My father was a builder in Ramat Gan. And you my, wife was the, my wife was the beauty queen of Ramat Gan. Really? Yeah. And you guys get married two, two months after this? Two months after In that. June? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Go two months and we wanted to have a child first. Because my wife was 25. In those days, 25 was an old maid. A real old maid. Rina, you're still young. You're not 25 yet. You were 22. Huh? You were 22. <laughs> 22. Tell me. Um, just a second. Tell me. Five more minutes. When you look back, when you look today at the state of Israel, today at the state of Israel, does anything worry you? Rina. What what come on? I don't know the 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 social situation in the country. The like I don't know. I never go into those particulars. I don't know. If you don't go in and make make an issue out of them, you don't know about them. I live my life. You live your life. And they go on. I couldn't care hell what the, what 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 Mankel said, what Yankel said, what Schmankel said. I'm not talking about Yankel or Schmankel. I'm talking about is. Is, is this a safe place for your grandchildren to be? Is it still oh, safe the safest place? in the world. I'm here to protect him. Please. The safest country in the world for any Jew is Israel. In Israel, you forget you're a Jew. I grew up being uh, conscious of being a Jew in Aketia. I forgot I'm a Jew. I'm a human being. I'm not a Jew. I'm a human being. Rina is a Bashiksa. Wait. So you know, I, I built you up. So tell me, you, you, you got married in 1949. That's right. And you became eventually a contractor yourself. That's Is that right. correct? That's right. And for how many years did you work as a contractor? Well, I worked as a laborer first. Sure, yeah. So I, I used to travel from Ramat Gan to Tel Aviv by bike to work in the building. Uh -huh. So I worked for a couple of years as a laborer. And then a manager, and then a contractor. And did you have your own company as a contractor? Afterwards, yes. You opened your, opened your own yes. company. And how many children did, did you, do you have? Three. Three. My daughter is famous. Okay. She's an actress. Okay. She's one of the top actresses in Israel. What's her name? Edith Tepperson. Okay. She's with Habima. Habima, okay. And I have uh, two sons. Both of them today running my my businesses, <laughs> and that's it. And how many grandchildren do you have? Six. Very nice. So I'm very comfortable, and of course I have Rina on the sideline. Of course. That's my sideline. How do you like my sideline, Rina? Will you please introduce yourself? <clears throat> okay. That's my virgin. Look at the grandma virgin. You seen a grandma virgin in the head? So, David, I want to thank you. Um, wait a sec. Okay, thank you. You switching off? <laughs>